Today on Chalk Radio, we're expanding our traditional understanding of economics. At the end of the day, what economists should be trying to do or economics should try to do is maximize people's well-being. I'm your host, Sarah Hansen. Today we're talking about economics and well-being, from exploring the impact of sleep trends in decision-making to dissecting why students procrastinate Dr. Frank Schilbach is working to understand how our psychological well-being impacts our economic behaviors, and vice versa. My name is Frank Schilbach. I'm an associate professor at MIT in the economics department. I study mostly issues related to poverty, studying development economics or developing countries, and I'm specifically interested in issues that disproportionately affect the poor that are in one way or the other psychological or have psychological effects. These include sleep deprivation, physical pain, loneliness, mental distress or mental health issues such as depression or anxiety or just worries about money. And all of these factors might affect people's psychological well-being. They might also have impacts on people's decision-making such as how much money to save, whether to purchase insurance or what food to eat or purchase as well as people's work decisions. So how productive people are at work, how many hours they work, how much do they earn. And altogether, these might affect people's ability to escape poverty or become richer in the future, and thus, as a whole, perhaps lead to what people might call a psychological poverty trap, because they have to struggle with so many issues associated with poverty. Their sleeping conditions are bad, struggle with mental distress, etc. Because he seeks to include these social factors in his work, Frank's model of economics diverges from many traditional models. Our lab is really the world. We can look around and talk to people every day and experience things, try to introspect how we make decisions ourselves, but also talk to people and try to understand. And you can take a cab or an Uber and just ask your Uber driver how they're making choices on whether or not to stop working or how much to work. You can ask anybody and your friends and so on try to understand how they make choices in their lives and what factors seem important. Some of the research that I've been doing on sleep, but also on alcohol consumption and on mental health comes very much from this type of approach. I spent some time in India trying to work on some research projects and while working on these research projects, I spent a lot of time talking to people. So I'd have lots of conversations with people, asking them very basic things about what are things that make you happy? What are things that are difficult in your life? What are things that you think that could be improved? Or if you could improve one thing in your life, what would you do? And so on. And a lot of the things that I'm now studying are precisely issues that are in some ways overlooked by or have until recently at least not received a lot of attention in economics so far. For example, say sleep deprivation. Yet they seemed really important in part because if you just look at people's sleeping conditions, they are replete with all sorts of factors that are terrible for people's sleep. And this is where the introspection comes in. If you then think about how do you function on a really bad night of sleep, you know, that's very difficult, at least for me. So if I sleep badly, I'm very sensitive to sleep. I I don't function particularly well. And putting these things together has then gotten me interested in understanding and researching the impact of improving sleep on people's lives. Intuitively, I know sleep deprivation is bad. I feel grumpy and impatient and get frustrated more easily when I don't get enough sleep. But I had no idea it might affect how much money I make and how much money I save. So what we did in one of our studies, we tried to provide people with different interventions to improve their sleep including eye shades, earplugs, mattress, table fan, and so on. So these are all kind of interventions to improve your sleep environment. We also gave people some information about doctors say, you know, sleep is important for your health. And other people were given incentives to sleep more. So they're actually paid by the number of hours that they slept. And the more they slept, the more they were paid. And all of these interventions were, in fact, quite successful in increasing people's sleep. And what we were then interested in is now if you increase your sleep, does it improve different aspects of your life, ranging from cognition? So these are just measures of attention, work productivity. So we hired people for a month to work as data entry workers. So then we looked at people's labor supply. How many hours did people work? How productive were they? How fast did they work? How many mistakes did they make? And so on. How much money did they earn overall? And so is it the case that if you sleep more now, do you make more money at work on an everyday basis? And then we looked at other things such as savings. We gave people an attractive savings opportunities. You look at do people save more when they sleep more? 
as well as economists would call preferences, which is time, risk, and social preferences. So how do you make decisions over time? How pro-social are you when you decide between your own outcomes versus others? How, how nice are you to others? And how do you make decisions in the face of risk? And the idea here would be that if you found effects, people might, for example, be more patient if they have slept more. So they might be willing to save more for the future, which could have high returns in the future. At MIT, Frank's work in behavioral economics seeks to enhance current economic models with insights from anthropology and sociology in order to make the field of economics reflect what actually goes on in people's lives. I asked Frank to explain a bit more about how his work builds on traditional economic models. Economics makes a lot of very stark assumptions on people's behavior. So economics usually, or standard economics usually assumes that people are very rational, they're very willful, they're also very well-informed and very attentive. So you can think of this as, and this is usually called homo economicus, this is a person, sort of the ideal human who doesn't make any mistakes, who makes perfect decisions, and is always right in what they do, and they perfectly optimize at any point in time. Frank explained that although standard economics frameworks do help explain a lot of important behaviors, their assumptions often miss some important parts of people's choices. Looking through a psychological lens can help round out the picture. There are a number of examples in which psychological insights have been quite important in informing models. One very successful area is the area of self-control or decision-making over time. This is the question on when we have unpleasant tasks that we might not want to do, for example, or when we choose when to do certain things or when to consume uh, earlier versus later, when there are temptations and when people try to procrastinate, people tend to have imperfect self-control. So we don't always do the things we plan to do. We don't always plan to do the things we want to do on time. Students procrastinate their problem sets. Faculty procrastinate writing their problem sets. People consume too early. People overeat. People overindulge in things that are joyful in the moment but have perhaps long-run consequences. And people underinvest in things that are painful in the moment, like, say, going to the gym or going to the doctor or making good health choices that are, in fact, then costly in the future. And so behavioral economics has then tried to model and try to understand self-control problems or what people call present focus, which is people excessively focus on the present. They put lots of weight on what they experience right now. If you have a donut in front of you, it's hard to resist. Or if you're in bed in the morning and think about should I exercise early or should I sleep for another hour, it might be very tempting to say, well, I'd rather sleep another hour, even though your plan was very much to get up early and exercise and be virtuous and so on. And so now behavioral economics has helped us understand such issues and potential ways to overcome them through what people call uh, commitment devices, for example, which are essentially contracts or type of policies that might help people overcome self-control issues. That's interesting. I also think, especially what you say about using insights from anthropology to inform standard models, like insights from community members and anthropologists working with community members It might look like someone is not making an informed decision. Once you start looking into the community network, a decision that might not seem rational might actually be very rational in that particular context. Like they might be making decisions based on ties to other community members or reciprocity or, you know, things that would benefit them in other ways that these standardized models might miss. And I think it it might be a way to make economics more culturally relevant or informed. That's exactly right. So in a way, you might see people's choices and think that they're making irrational choices one way or the other. But in fact, it's that our models are misspecified. So typically, our definition of rationality is to say we can have a set of choices or preferences. We can have some model of your behavior that explains what you're doing overall. And if you can have such a model, then we can rationalize your behavior in some ways and we say certain choices are rational. Now, if you make certain choices where our existing models say, this does not compute, this does not add up, it doesn't seem right, one might be tempted to say, well, these choices appear irrational. But in fact, they're not irrational. It's just we have misspecified the model. We have misunderstood. We have forgotten or or omitted certain factors that seem important. And those could be exactly, as you say, like social or cultural factors, how people care about others or how people care about others' influences potentially. 
and that could be really important. Before we get back to our interview with Frank, we wanted to take a moment to thank all of our listeners who have written to us with appreciation, feedback, and questions for our guests. We also wanted to thank those of you who've left us ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts. Hearing how much you're enjoying the show means a lot to us. So we thought it might be a good idea to share some of these reviews from time to time on the show, starting with this one, which also happens to include a suggestion. It says, I am very thankful that this podcast exists. As mentioned in the trailer, it is close to being able to have a quick conversation with these great professors about their interesting courses. I love the episode with Gilbert Strang and look forward to listening to subjects that I would not normally be exposed to. Suggestion. Please do an episode on 6001 with Dr. Anna Bell, Professor Eric Grimson, and Professor John Gutag. Wow, what a great review. Thank you so much. Um, So interestingly, Eric Grimson was recently named Interim Vice President for Open Learning, which technically means he's my colleague now. And, you know, I think he'd probably be into the idea of appearing on Chalk Radio. So why don't I give him a call right now? Hello? Hi, Eric. This is Sarah from Chalk Radio. Hi, Sarah. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, um, we got a request to have you on the show um, to talk about computer programming, and I'm wondering if you'd be up for that. I'd love to. It'd be great. Right. Just let me know when and where. I'll be there. Great. We'll be in touch, and we'll talk soon. Well, there you have it. You can look forward to an interview with Eric Grimson later this season on Chalk Radio. And if you have a suggestion for a guest you'd like to hear on Chalk Radio, you can let us know in a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can email us directly at chalkradio at mit.edu. Okay, now back to our interview with Frank Schilbach. It's clear students' mental health is an important factor for Frank, and he takes that into account in the way he structures his course. When I started, my problem was that we do at 9 a.m. or whatever in class, essentially, at the beginning of class. And that's very standard in many classes at MIT. But of course, what that leads to is students like pulling all-nighters or doing the problem sets in the middle of the night, which, you know, arguably is not good for them or good for their health or their mental health, for that matter. And so now I shifted to to having problem sets we do at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m., in fact, on Fridays, in part, because I want students to, to have some weekends and, again, not work in the middle of the night. So very small choices that I like to think are well-informed by at least some behavioral economics or psychological considerations. Yeah. It also pushes mental health and wellness out of this cordoned off area that like, oh, yeah, it's important to think about, but we're going to like consider all these other things first. You're really pulling it into the center of what you're doing, which is, I think, a pretty unique approach to teaching. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's also in economics more broadly, mental health, at least until recently, has not received a lot of attention. So in some of the research that I have been doing, it's still viewed as in some ways instrumental in the sense that you say, well, if you can improve people's mental health, we can improve people's productivity or the decision making or other types of outcomes. What I increasingly think is, is in fact, more important is just mental health by itself as an outcome is what we should strive for. Of course, that's very hard to measure in some ways, in the sense that economists believe in choices and hard outcomes such as productivity or earnings or the like that are easier to measure. And mental health is much more difficult to measure in some ways. But at the end of the day, what economists should be trying to do or economics should try to do is maximize people's well-being. All right, my last question. So on your OCW website page, there's an image of a credit card frozen in ice in a glass. So 30 second answer, should we all be freezing our credit cards? At some point was showing my wife uh, this exact slide with this exact example. And she was then just telling me, well, haven't you seen Confessions of a Shopaholic? Which in fact is this movie where somebody exactly has this approach. And the bottom line from that movie is, well, there is a person who really likes to shop and she has in fact frozen her credit card and then wants to shop, gets the credit card out of the freezer, 
but then just spends a lot of time with trying to unfreeze her credit card and then shops anyway. So you want to be kind of careful with these types of policies. Are they really achieving the behavior that you want to achieve? As in like, does it really make you shop less if you would like to do so? Or does it just make things more convenient when you kind of circumventing these types of policies or these types of things that you set out to do in the first place? So if it's just then you put your credit card into the freezer, then you unfreeze it by putting it into the bathtub or the like, then you just put in a lot of effort and shop anyway. And so you might as well have just shopped in the first place if that makes you happy. Frank's approach of including societal factors, such as mental health and economic models, is what makes his work so important and what makes economics feel so human and accessible. If you're ready to dive into teaching or learning with his materials, you can find them on our MIT OpenCourseWare website. There you'll find his 23 video lectures, lecture slides, recitation notes, problem sets with solutions, and quizzes with solutions, all available for reuse and remixing, and all for free. You can help others find the materials too by subscribing to this podcast and leaving us a rating and review. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, signing off from Cambridge, Massachusetts, I'm your host, Sarah Hansen from MIT OpenCourseWare. MIT Chalk Radio's producers include myself, Brett Pachi, and Dave Lashansky. Our scriptwriter is Nidhi Shastri. Show notes for this episode were written by Peter Chipman. Frank Schilbach's OCW course site was built by Cheryl Siegel. We're funded by MIT Open Learning and supporters like you.